know that tune. Millions of people do, although they might not know where it comes from. It's part of the second piano concerto by the Russian composer Sergei Rachmaninoff. And it's probably the most popular concerto in the world. And who am I? My name's Rachel Franklin. I'm a pianist and I perform classical music and I speak about classical music and I teach classical music. I really love classical music. Actually, I really love most music, but classical music is what I know more about. And I have this burning mission to tell everyone how amazing it is, because here's how I feel about it. If everybody out there gets the chance to enter this extraordinarily beautiful and passionate and inspiring musical world, then test scores will go up and cholesterol levels will go down and mortgage rates will be better and everyone's lives will greatly improve. And I'm starting with this piano concerto because it's gorgeous and because there's lots to share about it. It's exactly the style of music that we associate with Sergei Rachmaninoff. It's intensely romantic, it's hard driving, it's fiery, it's brilliantly technical, very hard to play. And it's the kind of music that reaches right inside of you and turns your heart to pulp. Now, Rachmaninoff died right here in the US in 1943, but for millions of music lovers out there, he's never left. Audiences continue to pack concert halls to goggle at the latest young piano titan roaring through a Rachmaninoff piano concerto, or perhaps to soak themselves in his ravishing symphonic music. Soon after he died, popular culture began swiping many of his best tunes for movie scores and soupy love songs. So you might think that the creator of the concert world's most romantic music would look like some kind of heartthrob, right? And here he is, the face that launched a thousand ships. Shaven head, grim expression, apparently humorless, lined face. People have joked that Rachmaninoff looks like the old-fashioned cartoon stereotype of a gangster. And this was the austere image that he also presented on stage. You see, quite apart from his compositions, Rachmaninoff was also probably the most celebrated performing pianist of the earlier part of the 20th century. And when he stalked onto the platform, sat almost motionless at the piano, and placed his honking great hands on the keyboard, audiences held their breath because they knew they were about to witness something utterly amazing. As with the man, so with the music. Part of the reason Rachmaninoff's music is so powerful is that while it has intense emotional strength and long sensuous melodies that seem to stretch to some far Russian horizon, at the same time we experience a gripping sense of restraint, a feeling of explosive energy that's only just contained, which is why we love it so much. Great works of art frequently have remarkable stories behind them. Uh, this concerto has one of the best. Here's what happened. Rachmaninoff had already achieved great success by his early 20s. He was renowned as a composer, as a conductor. He'd won all the important prizes at college. And by 1897, when he was 24, Russia was waiting for his most anticipated composition, the big production number that proves you can cut it with the grown-ups. Your first symphony. No pressure, right? Paul Rachmaninoff. We know now that this is a fine first symphony, but at its premiere, it bombed. It's very possible that conductor was drunk, but either way, the audience found it incomprehensible and the critics hated it. One critic in particular, César Cui, a military man and a fellow composer, what a surprise, wrote a particularly vicious review. If there were a conservatory in hell, and if one of its talented students was to compose a program symphony 
based on the story of the Ten Plagues of Egypt. And if he were to compose a symphony like Mr. Rachmaninoff's, then he would have fulfilled his task brilliantly and would delight the inhabitants of hell. Thanks. They don't write them like that anymore. Rachmaninoff was devastated. Yeah, we all know artists aren't supposed to take any notice of critics, but he was utterly crushed, and he sank instantly into a complete writer's block. Months went by, he couldn't compose a thing. His family and friends were very worried about him. His career had shuddered to a complete halt. So they took him on rescuers, and they tried to hook him up with inspiring cultural figures like Tolstoy, and they consulted with eminent physicians. Nothing worked. And then someone had an idea. It was suggested that Rachmaninoff visit the home of perhaps the most unusual doctor in Moscow, one Dr. Nikolai Dahl, a hypnotist. So Rachmaninoff went, and he would lie on Dr. Dahl's comfy sofa, and they would discuss art and culture and philosophy. And Dr. Dahl would intone soothingly, You will write your next symphony. It will be fine work. You will achieve great success. And it worked. Rachmaninoff began to compose again. And the next major work he produced was this piano concerto, which he dedicated to Dr. Dahl. It's interesting that even then, Rachmaninoff wrote the second and third movements first, and only when they were hailed as masterpieces was he assured that he actually had a real hit on his hands, and he bit the bullet and he composed the first movement. So he wrote the whole concerto backwards.